Cory Doctorow is a science fiction author, activist, journalist, blogger, and co-editor of BoingBoing.net. He's also the former European director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and co-founder of the UK Open Rights Group. His latest book, Information Doesn't Want to Be Free, came out in November 2014 from McSweeney's. Please join me in welcoming Cory Doctorow. Thank you all very much. Uh, sorry, there's some formalities here. Um, as a member in good standing of the Society of Conference and After Dinner Speakers of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and as the final speaker of the event, I am bound by our code of conduct to make a joke about being between you and the bar. This is that joke. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sincerely, thank you. Uh, everyone's been giving their Toronto credentials. I was born sort of over there, Women's College Hospital, lived here for 30 years, don't live here anymore, but still think of myself as a Torontonian, enough at least that our mayors dismay me. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll get a chance for a Q&A afterwards, but if we do uh, early notice, uh, my Q&As are often kind of a sausage fest, so I now alternate, so people who identify as men, people who identify as female or non-binary, so just get your questions ready. And with that, I'll begin the talk. Uh, like many of you, I'm in the business of earning my living online, uh, and even if you're not earning your living online today, you almost certainly will be tomorrow, not because jobs are going to move online tomorrow, but because everything will move online tomorrow. Everything we do today involves the internet, and everything we do tomorrow will certainly require it. Now, the wonderful thing about earning a living from your creative labor is that there are so many ways that we can do it. Virtually every commercially successful artist is a one-off, earning her living in a way that's distinct from what everyone else is doing. Of course, the corollary is that the terrible thing about creative labor is that it's insanely hard to figure out which of those millions of things you should do to earn a living from it. Practically everyone who's ever set out to earn a living as an artist not only failed, they actually lost money. And this is true independent of the medium, the era, or the technology around them. Indeed, a living in the creative fields is so rare that it's possible that they're just statistical noise. You know, one of these Six Sigma events. Like you could imagine if you had a firing line of millions of people flipping coins, some would get heads, some would get tails, and some would have their coins land on edge if you had enough people and enough flips. Now, the people whose coins landed on edge might be expert coin flippers. But maybe they devoted every waking hour to improving their coin flipping ability. Uh, and obviously one thing that helps you is if you do a lot of coin flips, you have a better chance of your coin landing on edge. But it's facially obvious, even without having to see them, that the thing that unites coin flippers whose coins land on edge is luck. Right? It's some chance combination, a, a perfect storm of a lucky win, a lucky toss, a lucky landing. If the winners of the Edge On coin contests were faded and handsomely paid and featured on the covers of magazines and lauded for their intrinsic virtue, it's likely that lots of people would pursue a living as coin tossers. After all, people buy lottery tickets. And what's more, if flipping a coin was deeply and profoundly satisfying and made a heartfelt connection between the coin flipper and the people watching the coin being flipped, living in a coin toss world would be downright noble. And that's basically the arts. Making art is innate to our condition. Babies make art. We treat PTSD with art ter therapy, singing and telling stories and making pictures. They seem to be part and parcel of the human condition. And we do treat successful artists with reverence that often borders on worship, which certainly makes an attractive proposition for being an artist, at least if you're on the outside looking in. But the arts are foundationally a non-market activity. People who set out to earn a living in the arts, although they want to, to uh, do something in a market, they're not engaged in anything like a rational economic calculus. They're setting out to win that edge on coin contest where beyond trying a lot and practicing a lot, a lot there's no way to win without getting very, very, very lucky. But when we talk about the internet and the arts, we talk about which business models serve artists best, which is very backwards looking. There are so many people who pursue the arts at any given moment that whatever business model happens to work at that moment will have no shortage of artists who match it and thrive through it. 
trying to preserve business models is just another way of saying that last year's lottery winners should be guaranteed to win next year's lottery as well, which is obviously a nice deal for the lotto winners. And speaking as one of those lotto winners, I'm not entirely opposed to that proposition. But it's the kind of cure that's apt to be much worse than the disease. Business models emerge from wider social questions, our technology, economy, politics, and tastes. And if you freeze old business models, you do so at the expense of everyone who would come later to succeed in the new ones. And you end up going to war against those technological, economic, political, and social factors that are selected for those new business models. Speaking as an artist, who found a niche in the business models of the past two decades and who's hoping to find a niche in the next couple decades worth of business models, I'm here to suggest that our priority should not be to defend business models. It should be to ensure that whatever business model works, that it keeps as much control as possible in the hands of creators first, in their investors second, and then in the distributors and retailers last. And to that end, I will propose today three ironclad laws for keeping the money flowing in the right direction. Things that we can choose as creators, as politician, that, that politicians and regulators can enact, that audiences and businesses can act upon to put money in the pockets of the people most directly involved in making the art that we all love. So the first law, Dr. O's first law, uh, I have to tell you a funny story about these laws before I'll tell you the first law. So I came up with the first law, Dr. O's law, at an at O'Reilly publishing conference a few years ago. And afterwards, one of the things that you do if you go to New York and you're a writer is you make your agent buy you lunch. So afterwards, I went to lunch with my agent and I said, I came up with a law, isn't that great? My agent used to be Arthur C. Clarke's agent and now he represents the estate. And he said, you can't have just one law. You have to have three. So I have three laws. Uh, so law number one, Dr. O's first law. Anytime someone puts a lock on something that belongs to you but won't give you the key, that lock isn't there for your benefit. So if you've ever made a digital product and uploaded it to Steam or Amazon or an Apple store, you get a tick box that says, would you like to protect your file or turn your piracy protection on? And of course, if you did this through a major publisher, you never even got to look at the tick box. It was almost certainly ticked by your publisher on your behalf. Um, so, uh, and uh, I beg your pardon, I lost my, my uh, track there. Uh, what that tick box does is add a layer of digital rights management to your work. This is supposed to stop people from making copies without your permission, though in practice it hasn't been very good at this. For it to work, DRM has to somehow provide the audience with a key to descramble the book uh, and somehow prescribe what they do now that they have that key, which after all lets them unscramble the book. Uh, so that they only do scramble the work in order to hear it or play it once and then throw away the descrambled version instead of saving that descrambled version to their hard drives so they can use it later without having to bother decrypting the DRM. Now, hiding a key in something that your adversary owns and can inspect and manipulate at will is a profoundly dumb idea for the same reason that keeping bank safes, no matter how great they are, in bank robbers' living rooms is a profoundly bad idea especially if the person that you're worried about, your adversary in the security model, is anyone in the world who would like to remove DRM uh, or any other work that's been locked up with DRM, and when that includes board grad students with the weekend off and an electron tunneling microscope. However, it's illegal to break digital locks, thanks to laws like the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the 2001 EUCD, and embarrassingly for those of us who are from Canada, Bill C-11, which was passed in 2011 at the behest of James Moore, the Tory MP from Coquitlam, who uh, you know, made a mistake that really can't be forgiven. I mean, it's one thing to make dumb mistakes about the internet in 1998, but if you're still paying, making dumb mistakes in 2011 about the internet, you either are not paying attention or someone's paying you not to pay attention. Uh, and there are versions of these laws all over the world in every industrial nation, thanks to the um, US trade representative going around and arm twisting the governments of the world into an adopting their own versions of the bill of uh, C D D C blah, DMCA. Now, of course, the DMCA's prohibition on breaking locks doesn't actually stop people from breaking locks. The easiest way to break a lock, if you're interested, is to just visit the Pirate Bay and download a copy of the work that has already had the lock removed from it. Um, but it does mean 
that uh, once Amazon or Apple or Adobe, and that's just the A's, puts its lock on your copyrighted work, you lose control over that work and over the customer who buys the work. That customer is now permanently bonded to the company that put the lock on your copyright. Because the only way to convert an iBook to a Google Play book or an Amazon Kindle book is to unlock it first. And the only company under all of these global laws that can authorize the conversion from an iBook to anything else is Apple. Just as only Google can authorize a conversion from Google Play to Amazon Video and so on and so on. Which means that inevitably, when you and your digital distributor have a negotiation in which your distributor wants a bigger share of the purchase price, you can't afford to turn them down. Because if you stop selling through Amazon and give discounts at Google to tempt your customers to convert their libraries and follow along with you, none of your best customers can take you up on the offer. Because the only way to go from Amazon to Google or Apple to Adobe is to dump all your purchased media and buy it again in a new format or maintain two separate ecosystems that you flip between depending on which retailer you bought it from. It's as though we passed a law that said that every time you bought a book from Chapters, you'd have to buy the bookcase from the brick. Now, you can understand why this would be good for the brick and good for Chapters, but it wouldn't be very good for the companies that are making the books. Now, this is not a hypothetical, this business where distributors get the whip hand when you put DRM on your works. All you have to do is think back last year to Hachette, when it had its uh, very famous and infamous dispute with Amazon, in which they had a disagreement about how much money should be going from one to the other. And Amazon locked, uh, uh, stopped selling Hachette's eBooks. And Hachette had to effectively capitulate to Amazon uh, because since the very first days, Hachette had been the publisher that was most aggressive about insisting that all of their works were sold with DRM. So its customers, more than any other publishers, had, uh, were locked to Amazon. And if it took its business elsewhere, those customers would remain in Amazon's wild garden. Now, this is only going to get worse. There's another Amazon division that you're familiar with called Audible that doesn't just control uh, a small majority of all the ebooks, but actually controls 90% of the digital audiobook market. They're the, also the only audiobook distributor that will sell into iTunes. And unlike Amazon with its ebook business, um, uh, Audible will only allow you to sell through them if, uh, you put, uh, if you allow them to put their DRM on your works. This is not optional when it comes to Audible. And they've already started to put the screws to the audiobook publishers and the studios. And this won't let up. It's not going to get better. It's, uh, I'll bet you a testicle, although not one of mine, that very soon they'll start locking suppliers out of their store unless they agree to enormous concessions in the revenue split and the marketing of their books. After all, Amazon uh, does not staff all of its divisions with hyper-competitive, cutthroat business people, except for Audible, where they send their patchouli-scented info hippies. They have a normalized degree of sociopathy across all business units, and you can expect every one of them to be equally aggressive. Um, and it's not just Amazon. Think of what Apple did with its App Store, where it started off by saying, if you will collectively invest trillions of dollars in making us the dominant platform, we will only take 30% of the initial purchase price, and you can keep all the money you make after that. And as soon as they attained platform dominance, they told all of the people who'd made them into the dominant platform that from now on, they were also going to take 30% of every penny that those apps gener generated for them from now on. And suppliers have to cave. Because every serious audiobook customer, the 20% of customers who represent 80% of sales, will have sunk thousands of dollars into an investment that's locked to Amazon until Amazon decides to unlock it, which is to say forever. Anytime someone promises you that by locking up your stuff, they'll protect you, you can tell that they're in it for themselves if they won't give you the key. So that's law number one. Law number two, fame won't make you rich, but you can't sell art without it. Now, Tim O'Reilly is a great font of amazing aphorisms. Those of you who know him know this. Uh, and one of my favorites is, for artists, the problem isn't piracy, it's obscurity. No doubt you've heard that. Um, but uh, many people who heard him say that, I think, misinterpreted him to, to, to believe that what he was saying was, once you're famous, you'll get rich. Uh, and of course, that's not true. I think what he meant to say was, if no one's heard of your stuff, they probably won't pay you for it. Now, of course, many people who have heard of your stuff probably won't pay you for it either. But none of the people who are ignorant of your very existence are ever going to give you any money. 
Now, in the 21st century, the way that people discover your work is via the internet. They use search engines, social media, online hosting providers like YouTube. And the way that we get paid for our works when they discover our audiences, should we manage the hard alchemy of converting people who know about us into people who pay us, is through internet payments. Payment processors like PayPal, ad brokers like Google, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter. The internet has spawned many independent successes who piece together all the functions of a publisher from parts of the internet. Some were artists who started out in the traditional world, people like Trent Reznor or Amanda Palmer. Some were artists who started as indies and then made the jump to big companies like XKCD's Mandelman Rowe or Randleman Rowe or Hugh Howey who wrote Wool. And some are artists who started indie and stayed indie like Jonathan Colton. The world of big content has been seized by the same industrial concentration factors that impacted every other sector from oil to finance. We're now left with five major publishers, four major labels, and five major studios. And it's axiomatic that when there are fewer buyers, the publishers, the sellers, uh, then sellers, the creators, get a worse deal. Right? It becomes a buyer's market. And the contracts that come standard from the big publishers and the big labels and the big studios reflect that, that nature, reflect that market reality. For example, uh, if you're a musician and you sign to one of the major labels, your standard contract will involve uh, an accounting practice on all of your royalty statements in which some of your royalties are deducted from every statement for breakage. Now, breakage is the percentage that was predicted uh, to be lost when vinyl record albums were moved by Teamsters from factories to retailers, but it's deducted from your digital royalties, right? Now, what's the accounting basis for deducting a certain percentage of your digital royalties for breakage of MP3s? It's this, right? <laughs> There's only four labels. If you don't like it, you know, like Lily Tomlin, well, we're the phone company. Uh, what are you going to do? You don't have to like it. Get two tin cans and a string, right? If you don't want to, if you don't want to be with a, with one of the four major record labels, this is our deal. Good luck out there in independent land. And of course, now we see novelists are being routinely asked to sign over not just their first print rights and not just their their ebook rights, but also graphic novel rights, audiobook rights, and uh, international translation rights as non-negotiable terms of standard publishing deals at some of the big five. Now, the existence of the indie channel presents a competitor of last result for the big companies. The worst deal a big company can offer you, economically speaking, has to be better than the best deal you think you can get for yourself if you walk out the door and try to build yourself a publisher out of parts you find lying around on the internet. So it follows that the more competitive the indie channel is, the more companies there are, the more disorganized they are, the more competitive they are, the more they're doing to try and tempt you to use them, the better the deal will be for artists, whether they go indie or whether they go to the big guys. The, and it's not coincidental that the independent sector is being clobbered by the big entertainment companies. For example, you will have remembered that Viacom sued YouTube, which is a division of Google, and asked the US Supreme Court to rule that YouTube should be liable for any copyright, in, copyright infringing videos they hosted unless they could somehow perfectly and a priori determine whether that video infringed on copyright. That is, unless, one of, unless they could somehow inspect the 128 hours of video that they receive every minute, uh, uh, they would face liability for the infringement of those videos. Now, even if there was the money to do this, there aren't enough lawyers in all the world or in all the history of the world to meet this challenge. You would hit the heat death of the universe long before you made a dent in all the video being uploaded to YouTube. Now, there's nothing particular in that position that Viacom took that would make uh, uh, for, uh, for Google and YouTube that would immunize other services like Twitter or Blogger or Facebook from the similar standard. Once you say it's the duty under law of an online service provider to ensure that nothing infringes copyright before it's made available to the public, then you've effectively uh, passed that law for everybody. Well, how could you resolve this, right? Where would you find all those lawyer hours, especially now that uh, Twitter and Facebook are competing to hire enough copyright lawyers to review all your status updates as well? Well, either all the online providers would have to charge money to access their platform, or they'd make you pay an insurer who would make you hire a lawyer to indemnify them from suits which is to say that the world of online publishing would be indistinguishable from cable TV, where if you're rich or if you're under the protection of a rich company, you get exposure, but if you aren't, you don't. 
And we have the uh, expansion of these intermediary li liability doctrines through which online publishers are expected to expend more and more resources in order to uh, ensure that no one's ox is getting gored in the entertainment industry. And those efforts uh, are underway in closed door negotiations like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which uh, the Obama administration has asked his Congress to fast track for him so that Congress won't be able to, to debate it before it's voted on and which Stephen Harper's government has also been an avid participant in and which threatens to put children in jail for watching TV the wrong way, as well as the, tra uh, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and many other secretly negotiated global trade agreements. And they all also contain provisions that extend this kind of liability regime, not just to people who host content, but to payment brokers, to registrars, to ad networks, to social media platforms, and so on. Now, just as DRM can't stop people from making copies, this stuff won't stop them from finding and downloading them. The dark net is immune to this kind of enforcement, and there are innumerable channels for getting stuff online. After all, the way that the net works is by making copies. A working internet is one that copies things faithfully, quickly, cheaply, anonymously, and with a minimum, minimum of fuss. Making the internet worse at making copies is like making water less wet. So all this will do in terms of the online sector is reduce the diversity and competitiveness in the world of services to indie creators. Uh, that is to say that if you want to start YouTube today, um, you can't just get three guys, a, a garage, and a pile of hard drives because now we have this de facto standard that you have to run a content ID system. You need three guys, a pile of hard drives, a garage, and $100 million worth of compliance wear. That's effectively made YouTube the very last YouTube that we're ever likely to get unless it's started by another big company with exactly the same game theoretical outcomes and victory conditions of YouTube, which is to say a company that will never offer you, a creator, a better job that YouTube is going to get. When we have fewer independent channels, the deal that indies get gets worse, and we see that happening already. Um, YouTube is starting a Spotify competitor, and so they gathered the four major labels in a room and negotiated the terms on which all of their music would be offered. They had to negotiate as equals because those companies are big and have deep pockets. Having done that, they turned around and gathered the indies and said, the bigs have decided what your terms are. They're actually not as good as the terms the bigs are getting, and you will take them or you will leave them, but if you leave them, you're no longer welcome on YouTube at all, and you can try and sell your music without promoting it on the world's most popular video service. And unsurprisingly, the indies have all stepped up. The new boss is the same as the old boss. Fame doesn't make you rich, but no one will give you money unless they've heard of you. And when the independent sectors through which we're known are effectively captive to the uh, existing media companies, then the deal that we get will never get any better. So those are my first two laws. The first one relates to the kind of uh, uh, economic relationships between distributors and publishers, and the second one relates to the economic relationships between creators and their, and their uh, publishers. The third law is a little more broad, and it's that information doesn't want to be free. Now, you may have heard people describe the platform of internet activists as being concerned with whether or not information wants to be free. So to get to the bottom of this, I invited uh, information to a weekend in the Muskokas. Uh, we rented a cottage, we built a sweat lodge, we, uh, we drank oaky Chardonnay, we, we cried about our parents. And when it was over, information gave me a long, soulful hug. I smelt the wood smoke in its beard and it whispered its confession in my ear, which is that all it wants from us is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. <laughs> because information doesn't want to be free, but people do. Information is an abstraction, it wants nothing. But people want to be free, and in the 21st century, when we are wiring up the nervous system of the information age, the way that you make people free is with free and fair information infrastructure. When we focus on how to regulate the internet to improve the lot of the 0.0001% of the world who earn their living from the arts, we treat the net as though it were a glorified video on demand service. But it's not. It's not a system for recruiting jihadis. It's not the world's greatest pornography distribution system. It is the nervous system of the 21st century through which everything we do is increasingly mediated. As I said at the start of this talk, everything we do today involves the internet and everything we do tomorrow will require it. So while it's true that DRM gets a, gives creators and publishers and audiences a bad deal, that's just a sideshow. 
The real cost of DRM is that in order to shore it up, virtually every country in the world has made it illegal to disclose information that could be used to jailbreak DRM locked devices, including Bill C-11 that was passed by, uh, that was introduced by uh, James Moore. And that means that anyone who tells you about vulnerabilities in your phone or your computer or your thermostat or your automobile firmware or the apps that control your hearing aid or your pacemaker can go to jail for telling you about them. Which means that the devices that we rely on as a matter of life and limb are being turned into long live reservoirs of pathological vulnerabilities, ripe for exploitation by creeps and voyeurs, identity thieves and spies, cops and governments. The world today uh, is, a, uh, is made out of computers. A modern building like this one is effectively a computer that we share space with. When you take the computers out of a building like this, for, uh, it becomes immediately uninhabitable. If you leave the computers out for any appreciable length of time, it will become permanently uninhabitable. All those Stark Attack novelty super skyscrapers going up anywhere the finance industry is colonized, those buildings are designed with computer-controlled dynamic stress allocation, where they change how this, the building braces itself based on wind and seismic stresses. Take the computers out of those buildings, they fall down. Um, and it's not just buildings that we live in, although we do all, all of us live in giant case mods, it's also cars, right? Your car is a, is a computer that drives you down the road at 120 kilometers an hour, and every year at conferences like DEF CON, we see presentations where people show that they can take over the firmware of your car using its Bluetooth interface and disable or control its steering and brakes. The most salient fact of your car is its informatics. Everything else is just a peripheral for that computer. We not only have our bodies inside of computers and, and in some pretty deadly ones, I'm going to fly home tonight to London on a Boeing 747, which is a flying Sun Solaris workstation in a very fancy aluminum case connected to some very tragically secured SCADA controllers. But we also increasingly keep computers inside of our bodies. Those of you who are my age and grew up with a Walkman, or if you're a little younger and you grew up with an MP3 player, you're logging enough punishing earbud hours that there will come a day when you'll get a hearing aid, right, if you're not killed by a self-driving car for First. And when you get that hearing aid, it will not be a beige retro hipster analog transistorized hearing aid. It'll be a computer inside your head and it will know what you hear and it will be able to tell other people what you hear and it'll be able to tell you things that aren't there and it will be able to stop you from hearing things that are there, all depending on how it's configured and regulated. Now, this may all sound like a hypothetical, but you know, I'm a very frequent traveler. Uh, I'm changing the climate, ask me how. And those of you who are road warriors, you know that the first law, if you're a frequent traveler, is ABC, always be charging. And so when you get into a new room, you scan for those handy little flip up trap doors and along the baseboards for electrical outlets because your laptop is your lifeline. So I was in an airport lounge and feeling very smug because I grabbed the only electrical outlet and I was charging up my laptop and working on it before the flight and a man walked up to me and he said, can I use that plug? And I kind of looked at him over my glasses and I said, I'm charging my laptop before the flight. And he rolled up his pants leg and he showed me the robotic prosthesis stra st strapped to the stump of his right leg. And he said, I need to charge my leg before the flight. <laughs> and I said, all right, you can have the plug. Stacking the deck against the disclosure of flaws in the devices that we rely upon for literally everything is an insane idea. Your iPhone is not a device for making phone calls and throwing birds at pigs. Your iPhone is a supercomputer in your pocket that knows who all of your friends are and what you talk to them about and where you go. It has a camera and a microphone and you take it into the bedroom and the toilet. It knows what your lawyer emailed you and how to log into your bank account and into the line of credit on your mortgage, right? And um, even if knowing facts about your iPhone might let you buy software from someone other than Apple, you should still be allowed to know the salient facts of your iPhone, especially if the salient fact about your iPhone is that it has a vulnerability that lets someone covertly monitor any or all of those functions. And when it comes to liability for our service providers, the major effect of making the service providers have greater and greater liability for the, host, for the material that they host or process has nothing to do with piracy. The 120 hours of video landing in YouTube's ingester every minute aren't amateur movies or pirate TV. 
their personal communications, their dialogue, their dissident footage from war zones, they're the raw stuff of communications. If you took all the material in the IMDB and uploaded it to YouTube at the rate of 128 hours a minute, after a week you'd need something else to fill that channel. So almost everything on YouTube a priori is not the stuff that we care about when we talk about piracy. And that goes for the tweets and the Facebook posts and the whole lot. And this is where someone usually says, but that's all trivial, isn't it? It's cat videos, which is really the height of arrogance. After all, what do we have except for trivialities, right? When my wife comes down to the morning for breakfast, I get up before uh, the family, I make them breakfast. And when she comes down, I ask her how she slept. And I don't ask her how she slept because I don't know. We, we share a bed, right? When my wife has a bad night, I know about it. I ask her how she slept because I am sending her a coded message in the world's easiest to decrypt cipher. It's a message that says, I love you, I'm thinking about you, I care about you, right? Every one of our significant relationships is built up out of a kind of hummus of millions and millions of these tiny and seemingly insignificant moments. And when we say, well, in order to ensure that nobody watches TV the wrong way, or nobody reads a book without paying for it, or nobody listens to music uh, in a way that we object to or in a territory where the music hasn't been licensed. We're going to require that the services through which all of these other relations are carried on should be subject to systems of unaccountable surveillance and unaccountable censorship with no penalties for abuse. Then we are doing something genuinely depraved to our brothers and sisters. The notice and takedown system that we've established in order to prevent people from infringing copyright and to give us a speedy remedy when we find our materials on the internet is routinely abused by every kind of thug and every kind of bully, whether it's the king of Thailand taking down videos critical of him during moments of political unrest, or homegrown neo-Nazis objecting to material that exposes their corruption. Um, in Canada, the same bill, C-11, uh, was passed with a notice and notice system. So ISPs are legally obliged to hand over your personal information, or forward notes, rather, on, um, to your personal address when someone sends them an unsubstantiated complaint of copyright infringement with no penalties if those uh, infringement notices are fraudulent. Uh, James Moore, when he was pondering the bill, received missives from copyright professors, economists, lawyers, and people in industry telling him that we needed a mechanism to curb abuse, and he didn't reply to them. And he passed the bill with no mechanism to, to uh, curb abuse. And as a consequence, American companies like Rights Corp, which is a publicly traded firm, send thousands of fraudulent notices to Canadians, speculative invoices, demanding that they give small sums of money, sums that are too small to even ask a lawyer whether you should be handing the money over all because James Moore didn't want to make it possible for someone who sent a bunch of takedown notices that were fraudulent, or sloppy rather, to face any kind of penalties for it. If you set up a, censor, a system of censorship without due process, you would be criminally naive to not expect it to be abused. Um, in the United States, Victoria Espinel, who's the former White House copyright czar, when she was uh, running the copyright brief, she set up a voluntary system, voluntary system, with the big ISPs, of which there are vanishingly few, thanks to um, uh, media concentration or market concentration all over the world in the telecom sector, that they would terminate in, uh, the internet access of families if people complained about copyright infringement, again, without any kind of corroboration or evidence and without any penalties for abuse, meaning that merely living in the vicinity of of a Wi-Fi access point that some unknown party may or may not have used to watch TV the wrong way would result in you and everyone in your house being given the internet death penalty for a year. Under uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we're contemplating prison for people who download. Now, in the UK, we have an interesting and checkered history with this kind of, uh, with this kind of law. Um, we have a bill called the Digital Economy Act that was passed in literally the last hour of the last parliament during a special session called the wash up when utility legislation that keeps the lights on during campaigning season is usually passed. Uh, the Digital Economy Act was passed without debate on a three line whip, which is to say if you didn't uh, vote for it, you would be kicked out of the party and not able to stand for election in the election that was called that day. Um, and it had a provision for this kind of thing too, this, this kind of disconnection from the internet. Now the interesting thing about it is what, uh, what kind of evidence there was that this would be a terrible idea. 
One thing you have to say about living in the UK is you meet people with awesome job titles. Um, there's a woman named Martha Lane Fox, uh, who currently has a pretty awesome do job title, the wonderfully Dungeons and Dragons -y Baroness of Soho. But before she was the Baroness of Soho, she was the champion for digital inclusion under the last parliament. And her job was to figure out how to get everybody on the, on the internet, everyone in the country on the internet. And one thing she wanted to do was find out why we should get everyone in the country onto the internet. So she hired Pri PricewaterhouseCooper to do a study on council estates. These are subsidized housing, um, social housing, or what Americans would call uh, housing projects. Um, there was a council estate where there had been free internet access for a couple of years, and there was a council estate next door where there hadn't been. People who lived in one building without having made any particular choice had had internet access. The people in the next door had not. So PricewaterhouseCooper studied the difference two years in. Now, you would expect that maybe their kids would be getting better grades or they'd be doing some internet banking, but in fact, every single thing that we care about when we measure quality of life and success of social programs and the health of a society improved for people who had internet access. After two years, their kids were more apt to go into tertiary education and were more socially mobile. The parents had better jobs and more disposable income. They had better nutrition outcomes and better health outcomes. They were more politically aware, more likely to vote, and more civically engaged in their communities and less socially isolated isolated from their neighbors. So when we as a society are prepared to collectively punish whole families who are accused without evidence of being entertained without permission uh, to, uh, by severing them from that single wire that delivers free speech, a free press, free assembly, access to education, access to uh, political and civic engagement, to nutrition, to social mobility, and to every other thing that we care about as a society, then it's clear as day that this is not a fight about whether information wants to be free but whether people want to be free. Now, I happen to believe that I can earn my living without having to spy on everyone, without being granted censorship authority over the internet. But even if I wasn't, even if I thought that I would have to go out and get a real job tomorrow, I would still fight for a free and fair internet. Because although all my life I dreamt of being a writer, and every day I wake up and think about how amazing it is that my coin landed on its edge, I am far more committed to bequeathing a fair world to my daughter than I've ever wanted to be an artist. There are millions of ways to earn a living from the arts and trillions of ways to fail spectacularly from earning a living in the arts. Ensuring that the artists who do succeed get as much money as in the system as is possible is a very noble goal. But even more than that, every artist and everyone involved in the arts should be opposed to censorship and surveillance and control because the arts should never be on the side of censorship, surveillance, and control. Try anything, try everything to get your coin to land on its edge. But if you have to break the internet to accomplish it, you're on the wrong side of history. Thank you.